Hello and welcome to episode 34 of Off the Bandstand. My name is Christian Wiggs. I am your host. Today's episode is Jacob Wise, a highly respected guitarist here in the Austin jazz scene. Jacob is a graduate of the University of North Texas in Denton, where he received his master's degree and was a member of the One O'Clock Lab Band, and currently serves as assistant professor on faculty at Austin Community College. Uh, In this episode, we talk about our own personal correlations between mindfulness and exercise. We also talk about the intense process that is the UNT Lab Band auditions, and Jacob recalls more than a few times that cruise ship gigs got a little rocky. So uh, moving on to the releases of the week, the first one is one that we plugged a few weeks back, but we wanted to make sure to bring it back into the spotlight. It's Jacob's second album as a band leader, which is called Paseo, that released in 2019. Uh, This has a lot of really thoughtful compositions on it that are met beautifully by the musicians on the session. Uh, We talk in the episode a little bit about considerations of making a record nowadays and what considerations went into Jacob's process when he was deciding to make this album, uh, you know, collecting all of his originals over the past several years. So if you want to support this release directly and support the musicians the most, you can go to jacobwise.bandcamp.com. And then if you want to learn more about all the other things he has going on, whether it's live performances, live streams, or new records, you can go over to jacobwisejazz.com. And then the second release that we want to make sure to plug is from Brian Carter, an absolutely ridiculous drummer up in New York, uh, playing with all the main cats, uh, up with Stephen Feige, Benny Benat, uh, Chad Lefkowitz Brown, uh, Charlie Rosen. I've recently been checking out a lot of his work on uh, the 8-Bit Big Band's new record, which is called Backwards Compatible, where he is just smoking those arrangements. Um, But going down the rabbit hole of all of his different stuff, uh, it led me to a release Um, that he put out last June um, in the wake of the George Floyd protest, uh, which is called Dear Blue. Um, And this, you know, whenever I initially listened to it, I was captivated by his gorgeous tone, but uh, reflecting on the lyrics, it has a completely other set of emotions that come along with it. Uh, The lyrics are written beautifully and delivered beautifully by Brian. So that's all that I'll say about it and let those speak for themselves. Uh, I would absolutely encourage everyone to go and listen to this tune and consider uh, the message behind it. If you want to uh, support this release, you can go over to BrianCarterMusic.com and you can see uh, kind of a music video of them putting it all together. Uh, and then if you want to buy this single, you can go over to LAReserve.BandCamp.com forward slash track forward slash deer dash blue. I know that's a lot to remember, so we put it down here uh, as always but I would absolutely implore everyone to go and support this track and support Brian's music directly. And we'll have him on uh, the show here in the next couple of weeks. So that way you can hear a little bit more about him as a musician himself. Uh, so that's it for the releases of the week. Let's move on to the Monk shows. Uh, the first one that we have to plug is tonight. It is the Ryan Hagler trio. That's March 4th, Thursday at 7.30 p.m. Uh, and then if you're listening to this after the day that it comes out, all of these concerts are are uh, kind of archived and backlogged on the Monk's uh, YouTube page, so you can go and check them out anytime that you'd like to. Uh, And then the next one is one I'm really excited about, uh, Ron Wilkins' Fortet uh, with his partner, Becca Patterson. Uh, That is going to be March 7th, uh, that's Sunday, again at 7.30. And then the last one that we want to plug for this week is Wayne Salzman's Groove Society, which is the next installment of the Austin Jazz Society Project Safety Net Concerts. Uh, That's going to be on Tuesday at 7.30. Again, Project Safety Net is an incredible initiative where they are raising money to take care of the most vulnerable jazz musicians to kind of give them that extra boost to get them to the other side of the pandemic where we can go back to normal and start playing gigs, you know, nightly like we were uh, before everything happened a year ago in March cannot believe it's been a year, but we're hanging through and through institutions like Monks, we're keeping the music alive. So I hope you'll consider checking into some of those uh, releases and checking them out. uh, And then also the uh, live streams as well. So that's it for all of the announcements. Let's dive right into today's episode. Here is episode 34, Jacob Wise. This is Off the Bandstand.
I'm I'm going to stop leading the question. I'm just going to ask you, what does exercise look like for you? Um, well, I mean, it's kind of like an important, to me, it's like an important part of being a musician. I mean, if you're, yeah. if your uh, body doesn't feel good, if you don't, if you're not healthy, if you don't feel good, uh, it's hard to, it's hard to play music. It's hard yeah. to focus. It's hard to concentrate. So, uh, for me, like I enjoy being outdoors. So today I kind of went on a walk slash jog. Um, I'll do that sometimes, um, you know, for a long time, I've really enjoyed swimming, like lap swimming. Okay. Um, I mean, I've been doing that for like 10 or 15 years now. Um, so my wife and I are members at the Y actually she, uh, you know, she has a day job, but kind of her side gig is she teaches yoga at the Y. So we've got okay. the family membership and, uh, for the past year or so, um, it's like one of the really the nicest things that happened during the pandemic was I got this Y membership and I would drive down there and swim um, three times a week. Okay. And that was awesome. Like I'd swim, basically I would get up to about, I started and I got up to about a mile each time. Mm. Oh, a mile um, swimming? Yeah. Woo. Yeah. And so that was great. Um, unfortunately, you know, due to the, the winter snowstorm we've had here in Austin, that kind of, um, I think there was some some kind of damage to the pipes and the pool system. So they're working it out. So unfortunately, haven't been, been able to swim for the last couple of weeks, but hopefully they'll get that fixed soon. Cause that's really, that's my favorite thing. Um, and it's just so valuable to like, you know, just exercise, get the blood flowing. Mm -hmm. I mean, obviously, you know, every musician, I mean, it's important to do if you're not a musician, obviously. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. <laughs> As a musician, every, every musician you use different, muscles in your body right yeah right i mean so like clearly as a i mean i can only speak for myself as a guitar player you know people think well you play guitar with your fingers right mm -hmm. it's like well yeah true but there's so much more than that you're using your you're using your arms your wrists your shoulders using your back i mean you know it's uh there's a lot of muscle groups involved sure so for me like personally i found that um swimming really helps with that at least for like strengthening your shoulders your back mm -hmm. your arms and like, it's just like very um, invigorating and relaxing, you know, yeah. um, also kind of like low impact, you know, you're not going to blow out your knees, blow out your, your arches doing sure. that. So anyway, love swimming. Um, but I mean, Hey, if I can't do that, like go for a walk. I mean, my favorite um, cell phone app is my pacer app. Mm -hmm. Love it. Just like, Hey, get a little obsessed with getting those 10,000 <laughs> steps. I think that's yeah. like positive. Or like I'll ride my bike, you know, I mean, like I said, in the pre pandemic time, my wife and I, we'd like go into a yoga class together once a week. Mm -hmm. And now it's like, Hey, might, might pop on the Pilates DVD and at least like do half an hour of that. Yeah, just try to mix sure. it up. Um, but like, mostly I just enjoy being outdoors, you know, um, yeah. I think it's so, so valuable, you know, I completely agree. Uh, Lydia and I, um, my girlfriend who I've been with for the past five years. I mean, one of the things that we've really found has, and this is going to sound kind of cliche, but it's, it's strengthened our relationship because you're like finding something very, and I mean, we were never like bad before we were never in any like dire straits or anything. Obviously five years is a long time, but we found that doing something that is so, I don't know if it's right to say like personally intimate, not even, not even with another person, but like, you have to be very, and we kind of talked about this in the text message, but like you have to be very mindful to be working out because it forces you to really focus on what your body's doing yeah. and like feeling all the different parts of your body that maybe you're not used to like using sitting at a desk if you have a desk job or like whatever you might do, you know, sitting in the car, going to your commute. So um, then like having that and just trying to be a little bit more reflective and a bit more aware, I think translates a lot to just like relationship stuff like how you're being mindful and aware of like your partner and then just like doing that activity together there's something about just like having something to do together that was uh took a lot of energy i don't know it just felt like like it was something that we bonded over even more so like past that like three or four year hump right where it's like yeah, no i think that's i think that's fantastic i mean you know for me i haven't done this for a while but i mean just like you know years and years ago um, and especially like it's my wife, you know, she's a certified yoga instructor and she's mm. way into it. She would, um, we would go to some classes together. Um, and I mean, obviously like it's a great thing to do with your partner that you're both 
um, you know, you share the same values and priorities and, uh, you know, you both care about being healthy. That's great. But of course, I mean, just like, you know, if you can relate it to the, um, musical side of things like in yoga, well, there's a lot of, um, breathing, you know, so like, that's very valuable to be aware of your breath. Um, you know, my wife, Claudette, she taught me uh, a new word, uh, which I didn't really know what this word meant or what it was, but the word okay. proprioception. I don't know if you've ever heard that word. It's the word of the day. I don't know it. Yeah, proprioception. Ahead. So that's just like a word, I guess, like in yoga instruction, which is, you know, when you're moving your body, are you aware of like, where are all your limbs in space? Okay. And uh, I think athletes are, are good at that or they're aware of that. I mean, you know, people who are dancers are aware of that. The people yeah. who aren't like really trained in one of those disciplines maybe we're not so aware of that. And Mm -hmm. you kind of see in, you know, like people who are like newbies to yoga, people say like, well, raise your right arm and somebody raises their left arm. And this is natural. Yeah, right. Um, But yeah, I guess the idea is that the more you attend yoga classes through the discipline of doing that, um, you become more aware of where, sorry, I want to decline that. So where, where are all your limbs in space? I think there's definitely a correlation with that in music. I mean, Mm -hmm. of course, like every musical instrument is very different. I can't really comment on like a wind instrument or voice. Yeah. Different thing. But I mean, like, like obviously, um, let's say playing a a guitar is very dexterity oriented, right? Yeah. You got four fingers. They can go anywhere on the fretboard. Where are the fingers in relation to each other? Where is Mm -hmm. the neck of the guitar in relation to your body? All of this stuff. Um, you know, where's my picking hand in relation to the strings. So like on a very like basic technical level, not musical, it's just like, you know, yeah. both hands are kind of performing this weird, complicated dance. Right. Sure. Yeah. So I think that like anything that you do that gets you really focusing on that, um, is good. I mean, whether that was actually playing sports, right. I mean, actually yeah. playing baseball, playing basketball, doing yoga, I mean, because of course, like yoga, it's more meditative, it's more reflective, you know, mm. to get you to slow down um, and just um, be still, be alone with your thoughts, um, which can be a very weird place, of course. Sure. I think all that stuff, um, it's really valuable. And like, hey, I wish I wish I had more time to do it. I wish it was uh, kind of accessible, um, but it's been helpful to me. Yeah. And hey, hopefully we'll, you know, in, you know, in due time, uh, when it's safe, like we'll be able to to get back to doing that stuff because it's really valuable. I mean, of course, yeah, not just for musicians. I think just like for anybody who wants to be, uh, you know, in tune with themselves, whatever whatever that looks yeah. like to you. Yeah, I think there's uh, definitely a stigma about um, meditation or or uh, yoga, all these different things that like. I'll even say I was like a part of it where I was like, like I would watch Lydia early in our uh early in our relationship do yoga and you know the people would be like and now focus on yada 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 and i was like oh this feels like at the time i was like oh this feels superficial and then now three years later i i go to bed listening to meditations of that exact same what, what i would say about that is that i mean you know yoga is like it's so mass market and not not that i'm an a, a yoga expert or a yoga nerd or anything but i can just say like in my experience of like you know 10 years going to classes here and there Mm -hmm. um the the instructors run the gamut the students run the gamut yeah and you just have to you just have to find people that you click with because i I mean some of them can be like very like annoying to me sure they can be very annoying to me the music can be annoying Mm -hmm. um and that's it's still, but it can still be a good class. Actually, yeah. if you do what they tell you and you go through the motions, I mean, it's a sure. practice, right? It's kind of like finding a music instructor. Yeah. You know, right. There are 10 instructors, you know, maybe out of those 10, seven are actually good. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Out of those seven uh, <laughs> that are good, you'll yeah. find one or two that you click with sure. and one or two that you don't. Now, yeah. what happens if you live in a small town and you don't have access to seven instructors? There's only one guy, right? but he's good. <laughs> you don't yeah. click with them hey you know it's still a good instructor yeah right it's not your optimal experience like this isn't the guy that i click with yeah but i mean you know we're fortunate we live in a big town it's like you have your office like well, I, that, that class mm. was a little too 
too weird for me. Sure. All right, I'll, I'll find someone. I'll find a, a yoga class. This is more like a gym, like a you know, a gym class. I mean, yeah. you know, yoga instructors. They're never. It's never going to be like P90X, right? Or you know, boot camp style. Those sure. those people just don't usually go for yoga. Yeah. Um, but I don't know. I just like I said. I think it, it's it'd be a great thing for anybody to incorporate once a week. Yeah. Um, for sure. I mean, and of course, like people who are professional athletes, they're understanding the benefit of doing it too, right? Oh, sure. Yeah. I, well, I think it's like when I found if there's anything that like the past year has taught me to be a little bit more of is is aware. Um, like whenever I go running, um, I, sometimes I like to, I know that this is like a privilege of being like a uh, male, but I like to go running at like midnight, 1 a.m. sometimes wow. because yeah. everything is super still. Yeah. Um, and I've always liked being a night owl. And I think it's maybe on a subconscious level, it's me trying to keep up my my sleeping pattern. So that way, whenever we do go back to gigs, it's not 10 p.m. and I'm having to play a club gig and just like yeah. falling asleep on the stand. But yeah. um, but I do like to stay up a little later, but I like it because there's something about where everything was chaotic, whether it was pedestrians or cars, people going in and out of shops. Like I live up in North in the domain. And so like that whole area is a hustle and bustle area, mm -hmm. but there's something about like midnight 1 AM when no one's out and everything's still. And it's kind of this opposite effect. And it, it causes me to be like, Oh, and, and not to get too like, you know, in the clouds, foo -foo about it, about it, but it's like, Oh, things are fleeting and you have to like be conscious of what's happening in every single moment and how it can be starkly contrasted from something that is going to happen five or not five hours from now, but if it's like midnight, 10 hours from now, this is going to be a completely different landscape because of the fact that it's going to be inhabited with tons of people. So it kind of helps me to like make a parallel between now with the pandemic. I mean, some things are starting to come back in limited capacities, but like, where the few first few months there was nothing where we went from playing you know 20 gigs a month till you know zero immediately like not even live streams like that wasn't even like really a thing on mm -hmm. anybody's schedule yet so anyways all that to say like i find that yes like exercise has done wonders for me in the sense that i'm able to just translate that kind of awareness and presentness that i associate with exercise to multiple different facets of life especially music yeah i mean like i said i mean any, anybody or not anybody but most people tell you like exercise is pretty important yeah just for your physical health like mental health i mean you know we can talk about this later yeah it's like mindfulness self-care i mean clearly that's important to musicians what does it look like everybody has a different you know take on that but i think anybody yeah. who's kind of like level-headed who has common sense who's like a healthcare yeah. professional they would kind of start with like, well, do you exercise? You know, are you eating right? Okay, yeah, if you're doing right. that, you know, that might be 50 to 80% right yeah. there. <laughs> and then like, you know, after that, we can, you know, we can, we can tweak. Yeah, but um, sure. yeah, I mean, you know, I, I guess, Christian, like, I don't know if your, your, your audience or your target audience, I mean, I'm assuming maybe it's a lot of people who are musicians or music students. Mm -hmm. And I know you mentioned that you wanted to um, talk about my experiences at North Texas. Yeah. So, um, yeah. Was there anything in particular that you had that you wanted to, to ask me about that? Yeah, man. So with, with the stuff at UNT, I think there, it, and it, maybe the theme of the day is stigmas, but uh, being that we'll go into like, you know, uh, self-care and stuff like that later. I think that there is sometimes a uh, stigma about like big schools that have like huge reputations that's not put on by the school itself. Right. But this kind of thing where we elevate it in our mind where it's like, well, we can go to music school and that's all well and good. But then like there's these huge top tier schools and like they must they must have all like the secrets and everything. And sometimes we almost equate. I've been guilty of this, of being like, well, I went to Texas State. I didn't get a jazz degree. I didn't go to UT or UNT or like Manhattan or Juilliard or whatever. Right. So I must be lesser than in some capacity. And I have a lot more yeah, homework yeah. to do. So I guess my, and this is pretty open-ended, but yeah, one yeah. of the specific things is like your experience at UNT. Did you have any of that going in? And then what did that look like from a reality standpoint of being in like inside the circle? Sure. Well, I mean, like North Texas, I mean, there's just so much to say about it because I had a great experience there. Yeah. But of course, like, you know, among music people, 
and jazz people like it is it's like a well-known institution it's a legendary institution yeah um you know and there's you know people have both positive and negative feelings about that of course um sure. uh i mean i love that so, you're smiling a lot no you no no it's just from the like, like i said like once you've gone to north texas what, what i've experienced is like wherever you go in the world you do meet people who went to north texas and you're kind of like in the north texas the club is, yeah, is the sure. word i'll use i mean like a couple times when i was working on cruise ships yeah bump into some guys that i'd never met personally and didn't even know who they were but they went to north texas and we had a lot to yeah. bond over sure so that was very cool but i mean that's just more because like the the jazz program there i mean it's a great music school sure period it's like one of the biggest in the country i mean so if you're studying jazz classical voice music ed piano whatever i mean mm. it's a great place to go um and of course, it attracts people from all over, but especially in jazz, you know, the tradition is so strong. The legacy yeah. is so strong. Right. Going back to the 40s and 50s, you know, being like the first program in the country that there's just like that. I mean, if I had met some older guy, older mm. gentleman, you know, who went there in the 60s and 70s, I'm sure we'd have a ton to talk about. Sure. So that, that you know, is very cool. Um, you know, uh, I mean, kind of what you're like speaking to a little bit is like, well, you use the word stigma I mean, there's that's not the word that i talk about but sure there's there's, there's like a word of like intimidation right okay. intimidation that can come from you when you hear these like brand name things sure. yeah what yeah, does it yeah. even mean you know like north texas what does that mean manhattan school of music not that i personally know people who went there you know sure. juilliard new, you know new england conservatory the university right. of miami university i mean yeah i personally don't know a ton of people who went to those schools but for whatever reason, those schools have like um, an outsized reputation. Sure. As we know, you know, you can be a great musician and come from anywhere, right? Yeah, right. Like you can go to any, you don't have to go to school, first of yeah. all. <laughs> right. Second yeah. of all, well, you yeah. should. Like second of all, it's like you go to any school. Uh, if it's decent, that's nice, but it's really 50 to 90% about the student's uh, drive and application do they apply right. themselves yeah but what i will tell you about north texas specifically is that my experience there uh was very unusual okay like, i did right. not have the typical north texas experience at all just because like my my background in music my musical journey like whatever you want to call it i think it's just a little unusual and i'm not okay. like, bragging about that i'm not saying well, I'm like Frank Sinatra. I did it my way. So, you know, my way is the best. I mean, I feel sure. like there's been a lot of uh, um, detours and roadblocks along the way. Yeah. But by the time I got to North Texas, like my experience was already pretty different, I would imagine, than like okay. the people who went there, right? Got it. Okay. So, because like, my, my background, like, first of all, like I didn't get a bachelor's degree in music. Okay. So that's like a little different because I've never met, I got a master's degree in jazz studies from North Texas, but yeah. I never met anybody there who's getting a master's degree in music who didn't already have a bachelor's degree sure, in music. Sure, sure. Yeah, yeah, You know, when I, you know, I went to high school, I went to UT Austin, I was a, a liberal arts major. They have what's okay. called like a, an honors liberal arts program. It's called the Plan 2 Honors Program. Okay. And I wish I could tell you more about it, but it's just kind of like, you know, it's liberal arts. You kind of choose your own adventure kind of thing. Yeah. And I guess it's kind of preparing you to be like in the liberal arts and then you're going to go to grad school and study something else. Sure. What I don't know. That? Like I wasn't really feeling it. I mean, I was good at school, but I was more into music. So yeah, I'm, in, I'm at UT, like I'm taking, I'm playing in bands, like funk hmm. bands, stuff like that. I'm taking guitar lessons from different people. There was a good, I had a good guitar teacher in college uh -huh. who was a North Texas guy and he lives in Austin. His name's Darren Lane. Okay. And he was from like, you know, the North Texas, like late nineties era when it was super hardcore. Yeah. And this guy like really pushed me to like, you know, you're, you're pretty good, I guess, but like you need to really get it together. You need to learn sure. to read music. You know, you need to learn tunes. And I, I was into it. I was, I was serious. And so like, I'm in college, I'm not a music major. I'm taking a couple elective music classes. Yeah. What, what like, were you I'm wanting playing, to I'm do? Playing, I'm playing gigs, you know, I'm playing jazz gigs. Yeah. Like little baby jazz gigs with other people. Um, and I'm kind of like, yeah, I'm a little more into this. So anyway, yeah. I graduate from college. And then it's kind of like, well, you know, now what? 
Yeah, right. So, I mean, that was a period of like several years, man. So it's like, I'm kind of working odd jobs, but I'm playing some gigs. I'm mm -hmm. practicing. I was teaching lessons at straight music. Okay. Anyway, let's like zoom over like four or five years. I'm like, sure. okay, I want to get a little more serious about this thing. I mean, I guess I want to go to school and study it. Yeah. It'd be nice to have a degree just to have it. Right. I mean, if I have that master's degree, whatever that means, I don't really know what that looks like. <laughs> yeah. like yeah. It'd be nice to teach, but I already have a bachelor's degree and like, it's a, it's a legit one. I mean, from like a major university, I don't yeah. want to like start over and get a bachelor's degree in music. I don't know what to do. Right. I don't know what to do. I'm confused. Right, right. I was confused. So at the time, I mean, this is already mid two thousands. Like I've been going to the elephant room a ton, uh -huh. playing at the jam sessions, you know, meeting people. And I don't know if you know who Freddie Mendoza is. Yeah. Right. So, you know, at the time, Freddie, who's a fantastic trombone player, great jazz musician, great guy. Mm. He um, was at Texas State. He was kind of, I don't know if he was the head of the department or the co-head of the department or whatever. But I, I was familiar with him and he was like, hey, man, I, I'd express this to him. I was like, hey, I want to get a music degree, but yeah. I don't really know how to go about doing it. He's like, I'll tell you what. You know, we could use someone like you at Texas State. You know, you're 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 a good player. You're a serious guy. You would be a great fit for us um, as like a graduate assistant. So I'll tell you what you do. You'll come here. Um, we don't have a master's degree in jazz, but you could be you could just kind of get your feet wet and enroll as a master's student in classical guitar. Okay. Meanwhile, I see your transcript has some gaping, glaring deficiencies. I'm going to enroll you in some classes like theory one, theory two. Okay. So he's essentially like kind of making a jazz master's degree for well, you, like sort of, kind of. No, not really. Anyway, okay. so anyway, so I, I got there and, you know, I'm playing in the big band, which was good. It was yeah. good at the time. He had me like coaching a combo. I'm like, you know, teaching some, a couple of guys guitar lessons. I'm taking theory one. And I'm kind of like, okay, you know, this is interesting. Yeah. I, I don't know, you know, the theory book level sure. one and two, but like, I'm taking sure. the classes. I'm passing it. And, you know, so this went on for like, um, gosh, I want to say like at least three semesters. Okay. This is where I met Damien Garcia for the first time. Okay. But anyway, like semester one of classical guitar, that didn't go so well. I don't <laughs> want to be a classical guitar player. Didn't really bond with the instructor who was a good guy. Yeah. Sure. Um, then Freddie's like, well, okay, that's no problem. Well, why don't you try composition? So I'm like, sure, man. You know, so. Switch over to composition. Meanwhile, I'm still playing in the big band. That's all. That's all cool. Whatever. Yeah. Didn't really click with that either. I was like, look, man, like I am a guitar player. I want to yeah. I want to be playing guitar, studying guitar, and I want to get a master's degree in jazz studies. I don't want to mm -hmm. get a master's degree in composition, in classical sure. guitar. I mean, that's not who I am. Yeah, right. So at that point, I'd already been there for two or three semesters, I think. And I was just like, okay, you know, I need to like apply to some other schools. Yeah. So basically, you know, I did the whole deal. I like applied to, I guess, like, I don't remember exactly. It was like five schools mm -hmm. around the country. Um, but the two that I auditioned at, I auditioned at um, Rutgers in New okay. Jersey. Yeah. Which is like, it's like the state school of New Jersey. Sure. And, you know, but the reason why I, that was on my radar is because one of my favorite guitar players was an instructor. There. And his name is was Vic Juris and he's like okay. a, you know he's like a legendary guy on the east coast sure temporary player so I remember this was like in 2009 or something so I flew okay. to, you know flew up to New York I auditioned it went well you know he was like I would love for you to come here mm -hmm. I was like oh that'd be cool then I went home and I was like hey, maybe maybe I'll go to this school and then I went home um a couple weeks later I went up to North Texas and I have a very funny story about the audition there. But okay. I, I, at the time, I was thinking, that's my plan B. Sure. Um, so maybe I didn't take it as seriously as I should have. I don't know. Okay. <laughs> but anyway, I drove up there and I did that. I was like, well, okay. And then as, a, as the months went by, I realized, like, there's no possible way I was ever going to go to Rutgers because it's out of state. It's very mm -hmm. expensive. And they didn't offer any financial aid. Oh, okay. Yeah. That's yeah. It. And that, that, that was just not going to be, that was not going to be happening, you sure. know? I mean, and plus, like when I really thought about it, I was like, yeah, you know, this school is pretty small. The music facilities aren't that great. Mm -hmm. It's to me, maybe yeah. things have changed, you know, sure. it's um, in New Brunswick, which is not exactly in the heart of Manhattan, you know, sure. so, I don't know. And then North Texas okay. was like, well, you're accepted. And I started looking, crunching the numbers like, wow, the tuition is a lot less. Yeah, right. 
anyway, so long story short, it's like, okay, so I chose North Texas. Okay. But then like, you know, there's more hurdles to jump through. So it's kind of like, oh yeah. So by the way, every incoming master's student at North Texas, and I'm sure this is standard for any school. Hmm. Once you get up there, you've got to go through all these different barrier exams to make sure you didn't forget all your music theory, sure. yeah, all yeah, your yeah. music history, and all your jazz theory, all your yeah. jazz history, all, <laughs> all, all your jazz your training. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. basically, there's like two days that are like this kind of hell day of taking all of these exams. Yeah. Now, I knew this was coming. I also knew I've never taken classical music history. Yeah. <laughs> Everybody told me like, man, you know, if you wind up having to take these classes like again, you'll be screwed because like, A, the classes suck. They're lame. They take forever. Yeah. Yeah. And it's going to add like a year to your degree. Sure. So I was like, man, okay, how do I, how do I avoid this hurdle? So basically I bought the books. I studied, I put like an ad on Craigslist or something. I found this really nice student at UT. I think his name was Kevin. He was a viola player and he tutored me for the summer. Oh man. I was like, cause I was like, I don't want to take those classes. So I was here he's like, here's what you need to know, man. Gregorian chant, A, B, C, D, classical, romantic. These are the buzzwords. So yeah, anyway, sure. So I was like, I studied my butt off and I got in there, oh. took those tests and like, they were hard. They yeah. were hard, but yeah. I, I passed them both by like three points. Yeah. <laughs> I was really, really lucky. So it's yeah. like, okay, that was fine. And then they, but then it's like, they give you all these jazz tests, which I, I wasn't as worried about, but like, it was pretty hardcore too. Yeah. You know, it's like an hour test on jazz theory, all written. Yeah. An hour test on like jazz history, all written. Yeah. And then jazz ear training, like identifying, you know, identifying chords, identifying scales. And like, I did fine on that, actually. Mm. So like, miraculously, I passed all that. Okay. So the only thing that like I bombed and like I legitimately bombed it because like I never took the classes and B, I probably wouldn't have been that good at it if I had was like um, classical, you know, ear training. Like here's a 12 tone row, write it down. Okay, right. you suck, next. And then there was like a classical piano class. Like, yeah, I can't do that. So they put me, but North Texas, they're pretty cool about it. They have a remedial classes in the summer. Okay, got it. So like, okay, next summer, you'll just take those and like, just, you know, just do it, get out of my face. Got yeah, it. sure, sure, sure. Um, and then there, I think there was um, the head of the department, who's a great guy and very understanding, you know, his mm -hmm. name is Dr. John Murphy. He was like, well, look you know, you know, all your jazz stuff. Like I'm impressed. You did good. Yeah. But I can tell on your transcript, you've never taken a range. Okay. And at North Texas, you know, that's really one of the most important classes in the undergraduate experience. Like you yeah, got to take sure. a ranging just so like you actually know harmony yeah. and aren't a complete, aren't a complete idiot. Yeah, sure. So I'm putting you in the, in the undergraduate, uh, arranging sequence, which is two semesters, even though you're a grad student. Okay. And, and, they, and they made me do the jazz piano sequence, which is basically like one class. Okay. But that was very cool. I mean, that was actually very helpful because, yeah. you know, I kind of practiced. The instructor was like, hey, I can tell you can't do it, but I can tell you're trying to do it and yeah. you, will, you will be able to do it. So basically, like, I want you to come back in, you know, three months. Mm -hmm. and if you can play these pages, I'll, I'll pass you. Okay. <laughs> um, so he's very cool yeah. about it. He's very understanding. And actually... That's one of the like the best lessons I got in North Texas. I was like, hey, you know, I wish I'd done I'd done this years ago because like mm -hmm. having the keyboard, even though I'm not like awesome on it, it's a sure. very helpful tool oh. for um for practicing for working on songs. So basically, I got there, I went through this like very stressful day of like all yeah. this stuff, but I got very lucky because I only had to take <laughs> like two remedial classes yeah. in the summer. But that's because like I took it seriously and I prepared sure. like my my experience could have been totally horrible. Mm. You know, I could have gotten there and they said, like, you got to take both semesters of music mm. history. You got to take all your jazz degree. So like my master's degree, which lasted two years, that could have lasted three years. Yeah, right. But like I said, the kicker on top of all that was like, okay, so I get there, like, you know, I don't really know what a typical master's student's like. It's like, I'm, I'm 32 when I get there, right? Mm. Okay. Um, but I've, I've played gigs, I'm experienced, but like, I know I want to get better. I know I want to learn. So then we get to like, you know, the legendary, you know, gladiator 
combat ego stress fest that is North Texas. Sure. Which is lab band. Yeah, I knew audition. that was where it was going. Right. Lab <laughs> band audition. I'm like, yeah. I, I already had friends with North Texas. They told me what the deal was. Um, long story short, you know, they basically already know who's good and who's not that good. So like when it comes to like picking the guys for the top band, they already know who mostly it is. Right. They just want to put people together to see like who kind of clicks. And so like for the one o'clock and two o'clock band, they just, they do auditions, but they put a bunch of people um, together on the bandstand and, and you read charts. Right. Um, and they were like, you know, I played in big bands in Texas state and prior to, and I was like, I was a decent reader for sure. Sure. Like, you know, it was hard stuff, but just like sight reading, like a pretty challenging up-tempo big band arrangement. Yeah. And I was just kind of like, uh, you know, this is hard. Yeah. This is right. stressful. It's hard and it's stressful. And, because... and would you say that that's by design? Of course it is. Okay, great. Yeah. It's I just wanted to make sure. Design. Yeah. It's completely yeah. by design because they want to see like, A, who's good, who's prepared, who has the skills and B, who can handle pressure. Yeah. Right. So that's part of life, you know? But I mean, literally, you're in Kenton Hall, you're, you're down there on the floor, you're rehearsing, and then up there, they've got like the Wizards Council of all the faculty, and there's five of them, they're seated on the very top row, videotaping stuff. And right. I mean, in, in real life, these are very nice guys, but they're like, no, these are the editions, like, okay. And basically, you play the chart, and they switch out the drummer, you play the same chart, they switch it out, like, okay, new chart. Yeah. So it's like a very, for me, it's like very weird and intimidating, because I was new. I mean, yeah. what I learned later is that basically anybody who is in that situation in North Texas is like, okay, I'm auditioning for a top band. They're like a college senior who's been there for four years before, or right. they're a graduate student. And at least half or 75% of the grad students in North Texas, they went there for their bachelor's degree. Right. So they know exactly what is going on. They're prepared. They've been preparing for this for years. I was just like, whoa, this is pretty intense, man. Sure. You know, like it's Texas, it's like, you know, there's two guitar players. They just plug you into a band, you know? Yeah, right. <laughs> anyway, so like, you know, much to my shock and surprise. And of course, to make it the ego stress fest outside of Kenton Hall, they've got this giant, it's like a cork board. And after every audition, somebody, you know, the wizards confer. <laughs> and then they come out like with a printout and they say, okay, nine o'clock band. Here's who's in it. Eight yeah. o'clock band. Who's in it? Then it goes up. Like, oh, three o'clock. Yeah. Yeah. Let's see that one. Two o'clock band. And then yeah. the grand finale, boom, sure. who's in the one o'clock band? Right. But yeah. So like, you know, anyway, I thought the audition was like, it's like, God, this was hard. I didn't do so well. Anyway, it's like much to my surprise. I don't remember the exact timeline. Mm -hmm. but it's like, there's the one o'clock band. Like, oh, my name's on it. Like, whoa. 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 Wasn't one o'clock band that. first time? Yeah. Right. Exactly. Boom. Whoa. Yeah, I know. And I was like, I was like, whoa, I wasn't expecting that. Like, I know this is a big deal, um, but you know it just kind of like it, it kind of blew my mind because like i said yeah i did know that most people would have to kind of like work for years and years and years and get to that point so like obviously right. i was lucky and as i said like going in there being a little older being a little more experienced i mean basically they can tell who is ready and who's not sure. for whatever reason i mean there were at that time i mean north texas it's a great school there's lots of guitar players a lot of them are good but there were only like, um, you know, three or four people that were like really experienced players. Mm -hmm. um, and I think for whatever reason, they just make that decision. There was myself. There was a great player named Scott Cruiser. Um, there was another guy called um, Matt Hornbeck. And, you mm -hmm. know, for whatever reason, like that, that year, that was my year. Yeah, sure. Now, but like I said, I had no idea how really challenging the music was. And so this became like this whole like trial by fire because you know that's you know august and they're kind of like oh by the way um you know they have a weekly big band concert in the in the syndicate which is like the student center on campus okay and you know the way it works is traditionally the one o'clock band they play the first concert yeah and that's like oh and that's in two weeks <laughs> nope <laughs> and that's in two weeks and we're playing all the songs from the album we recorded the previous year, which is like, in other words, in April. Yeah. Oh, and by the way, that album was amazing. All the compositions were very challenging. Yeah. And I think it was around that time, maybe a little later. 
oh, and by the way, it's nominated for a Grammy. So like, you know, you gotta like, and I just I'm like, oh, like, wow, I gotta learn this stuff. And like I said, they give you the music, you're rehearsing every day. Yeah. I'm like, man, this stuff is like freaking hard. Yeah. Um, and so like, of course, I feel like, I feel like the worst guy in the band, right? Because like, I mean, all the horn players, they'd been there forever. The rhythm mm-hmm. section, these guys were amazing, right? Yeah. Of course, they're much younger than me, man. Like yeah. they're all college seniors. Yeah. They've been doing North Texas army yeah four years right so they're like they're definitely better big band players than me you know yeah they're definitely better readers they know the whole deal they've been listening to the last year's band Mm -hmm. learning these songs rehearsing them they've had a year to like oh yeah man i want to get in the one o'clock band i know we're going to play those charts right so they probably got the music from the guys and shed it and so it's kind of like this is hard but i got them oh man so many notes yeah but like i said you know that's the that's the value of that type of environment and sure they were cool about it i mean like they were serious they're like look the drummer sean jones who's fantastic mm. he's like all right guys we're having sectionals you yeah. know and like i mean like really seriously sectionals and like you know it's kind of like well i feel like i got it together okay mm. like in hindsight of course there's like a million things i would have done differently but that would have basically honestly entailed like to do it the way as well as i would have liked to that would, would have entailed yeah. like dropping out of school and only practicing those charts all day long sure in, yeah, in a way yeah. in my mind right, you know right, right or like i mean like i was foolish you know it's like a part-time job because i it's like i need money man you know yeah sure. so i got a part-time job like in the music library really okay. not my best time <laughs> I, but i thought i needed money i had no money sure, you know sure i had no income so it's kind of like you know so it's like you're trying to like go to class you're trying to like work a part-time job. You're trying to like, you know, rehearse, play these charts. It was a lot. It was yeah. stressful, but is it was a good experience, you know? Sure. Because you, you, you realize like, hey, this, this is, at least in this environment, like this is the level. Yeah. And, you know, at least you have to hang on for dear life. You, you have to, you have to like tackle the stuff. And that's, that's what's awesome about North Texas. Just kind of like, this is the level. Yeah. This is the expectation. We we have determined that you're at this level. So you've yeah. got to stay at that, you've got to stay at that level and you got to sure. do the work. And that's, sure. that's like a really valuable um, aspect of that program that yeah. I, I found so valuable. Yeah. And I mean, that kind of leads in directly to another thing that I was curious to talk to you about, but before I say that I'm out of curiosity, uh, w- tell me the years that you were there at UNT. Um, well, I started in the fall of, um, I guess it was the fall of 2009. Okay. And I graduated in the spring of 2011. And then I went straight to work on cruise ships. Okay. So were you on the 2011 record that they put out? That's no, kind of like 2010. A, the 2010 album. Okay. Cause I, this is crazy. I mean, this also just shows my age. Uh, the, the beard is not fooling anybody. Uh, I was listening to those records in high school and there I was like, I was like, these are like the most ridiculous people in the world. I guess, were you, were you there at the same time that Sean Casey was there? Uh, ridiculous I, bass trombone player. Yeah, I think, yeah, I think we were there at the same time, but he, he's much younger and I think he yeah. might, we might not have really crossed paths. Okay. Gotcha. Yeah. Sean's dad. But yeah. That, that name sounds very familiar. Yeah. Yeah. Sean's dad is, um, uh, really prominent and retired now, but, uh, was a really prominent band director in Lake Jackson. Well, he was go. my first mentor. There you um, go. So yeah. And just comes from a ridiculous that family. Musical, musical family for sure. Oh yeah. Yeah. Um, but the thing that I was curious about was, um, and what it kind of led me into was, you had this mentality where you weren't taking anything for granted. You were really putting in the work and you thought for sure, you know, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but it seems like you didn't think that you were going to make the one o'clock because it was just like, Oh, this is a whirlwind of a situation. So then making the one o'clock, I feel like that is about the mentality of not being too terribly. um, And I want to be hesitant whenever I use the word comfortable, but not necessarily, it's, it, it's kind of a mentality of musicians don't want to be too comfortable because then we feel like we can almost get complacent and then we'll just like coast where we're at, like on our, on our, yeah. you know, playing ability level. Um, so I feel like sometimes we have this and like we were going to said earlier, we were going to talk about this unhealthy mentality of like, there needs to be some sort of voice in our head that is like, no, you know, uh, 
keep, keep going. Cause you have a lot to learn stuff like that, but sometimes that can be crippling for us. How mm -hmm. do you manage that in your own personal playing and evaluation of not beating yourself up too much, but not being complacent? Um, yeah, I mean, that's like a, that's like a lifelong quest. Yeah, I don't right. really think that most people honestly ever adequate adequately get a handle on that. Yeah. Uh, I mean, cause like there's people that are, we've heard stories of people who are so prominent, they're legendary uh, and they're admired by people around the world. And that there's yeah. these, these like, there's, there's these anecdotes of them like, Oh, I can't listen to my playing. It sucks. Yeah. Which, which is like objectively it doesn't, you know? Yeah, right. Right. But then they're, they've kind of got these weird hangups, which is, I don't really, I don't really know. I don't really know what that's about. You yeah. know? I mean, I guess there's, I mean, that what you're talking about, it's that can manifest in a lot of different ways, right? Yeah, right. I mean, it's like if you're if you're if you're playing a big band chart, <laughs> you know, one aspect of that is like, well, that I play the the notes that were written correctly. Yeah. Right. And that's not that doesn't really have a lot to do with your um improvisational abilities or exactly. theory knowledge, <laughs> you know. Yeah. It's just kind of like, I mean, can I physically play it? Did I put in the work? to figure it out yeah and of course then you've got to i mean if you're playing in a big band you've got to listen play with the other people be aware of dynamics and phrasing and all of that stuff but basically it's, it's kind of like a classical situation you're like am i executing this correctly yeah right. um and so like for me for north texas like reading the like music that's like definitely on the more most maximum complicated mm -hmm. side um which is not really what i want to do in life like that's just a challenge of like wow sure can you even attempt to learn this stuff because like yeah. i said it's not my inclination as a musician to like want to be you know staring at a chart five hours a day although that's a good skill to be good at i guess and maybe if i had gone to north texas for four years i would be like okay that's what you do with music you learn the yeah. chart and you play it perfect perfectly um but what I'm, what I'm kind of trying to get at is like, well, with that, that's just basically like, are you prepared? Yeah. Right. Do you actually practice? Do you understand what you're doing? And it's kind of like, if you're focused and you have, you put in the time, like you should be able to do it. Yeah. Right. Unless you're lazy. <laughs> yeah, sure. Sure. Okay. But it's like, okay, once you kind of like, okay, but I'm not talking about that anymore. You're talking about, man, my own personal self-expression my yeah. creativity like you know let's compare my solo on f blues versus this guy's solo on f blues or yeah you know my solo on f blues versus like the solo i would like to take on f blues and you know oh there's that kid and his solo on f blues is so much better than mine you know all yeah. i mean that's kind of what you're talking about right right yeah 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 and so how how you're, you're the question is like how do you um avoid crippling insecurity yet maintain the ability to keep practicing yeah right wow so i don't know like i'm not a i'm not i'm not the jazz whisperer you know sure sure like i'm not i'm not i'm not a guru but like of course like we all we all encounter that yeah um i think sometimes people try to look for a very obvious answer and and i think like and and i think that's a perfectly fine answer of like i'm not the the jazz i don't know i want mean, i, I, I want to answer that question for you for sure i'm just i'm just saying like in my way it's kind of like that is that's a very complicated answer because that's getting into psychology yeah. that's getting into, the, into right. the same thing as your body image yeah yeah and there's there's a lot of answers i don't i don't want to wade into the body image sure sure discussion sure. okay sure but like, if I was saying like, well, one answer to that be like, I'm, I'm really, I feel like my solo on F blues is not good enough. And there's a kid who's two years younger than me and his solo is better. So how, how do, how should I feel about that? Yeah. One answer is like, well, just play like a better solo and stop sucking. Sure, you know, sure. don't, don't suck. Right. Oh, how do I do that? It's like, right. well, what did your teacher tell you? Like, did you learn your scales really well? Do you have a good technique? Did you transcribe a bunch of solos did you practice the licks in 12 keys did you work on phrasing did you you know yada 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 like, did you do that no uh, okay well then once you do that stuff let's have this conversation again like, did you put sure. in the work sure right and, and i mean most people would say like well if you did the work then <laughs> your solo should sound good and you should sure. feel better about it ideally yeah 
But then like, what if you get to that level, like you do all that stuff and man, now I've been playing for years and I still feel like my solo on F blues, even though like objectively it has all the good stuff in it. I still don't like the way it sounds. Yeah. Right. Well, that's getting more into your psychology. Sure. So I'll, I'll tell you like one thing that's kind of helped me. And of course, like we all go through like ups and downs with that. Sure. Um, I think it's valuable to record yourself mm. practicing um, and, re- and record yourself, not practicing like for half an hour, but like, okay, I've, I'm, I've been playing, I'm warmed up. I'm going to play F blues or whatever the song is for like 60, 90 seconds. Yeah. I'm going to do my best solo hook that I can today and I'm going to listen to it. Yeah. And then I'm, I'm going to objectively critique that. I'm not going to like, well, I played at a jam last night and I didn't like the way it sounded, but I don't actually know what the hell I played. Yeah. I just know that I didn't feel good about it. It's like, okay, you can't, there's no objective takeaway from that. Sure. So you have to like listen to yourself. And so kind of like, you can at least be objective. Like, you know, actually that sounds better than I felt about it. Yeah. Right. Or like, yeah, well, actually there's some, I noticed something that I didn't realize I was doing. Yeah. And that could be a million things, you know? It could be like, wow, my tone wasn't as good as I thought it was, or my phrasing, or I can't execute that one lick, or why did I do that? Or like, you know, it sounds unhip. I mean, you, you, but you, yeah. if you listen to yourself playing for 60 seconds, like you should be able to have like one or two takeaways and like write it down on a sheet of paper. Don't do that. Practice right. not doing that. Yeah. I, and I think that is kind of helpful because basically, I mean, improvising is pretty open-ended. If you're playing something that's written on a piece of paper, you know pretty much in the moment if you played it correctly or not. And of course, if you listen back to it, you'll definitely know if you played it correctly. Yeah, right. So, you know, not not that classical music is easier. It's not, but you know, you the stand the standard of excellence is pretty clear cut. Yeah. Whereas in jazz, it's kind of like, well, I mean, you know, improvising is supposed to be at a high level. It's like. How am I feeling in the moment? How am I feeling today? What do I want to express today? How does yeah. that, how is that affected by the people I'm playing with mm. today in this room with this rhythm section, with this audience? I mean, not that you're playing wildly different stuff from performance to performance, but there's variables there. Yeah. Yet you want to have consistency. Yeah. And of course, the great players are very, very consistent. Yeah, right, right, right. There's, there's like, there's like, there's like no recorded examples that I'm aware of of like a bad, bad solo sure, by like right. Nicholas Payton, yeah, Mulgrew Miller, Kenny right. Garrett, Michael Brecker, Wynton Marsalis, Wes sure. Montgomery. The list goes on. Like, right, you, you guys never played objectively a bad solo. Sure, but I'm aware, right? And yet, who knows how they felt about their own playing? Right. But the point exactly. is like they they knew like that according to their standard of excellence, objectively, whatever they were playing was good or good enough. Right. So it's kind of like your baseline, it's like, you know, you like you never get like we always want to be at a hundred percent of like I'm gonna yeah. play the most excellent thing every time. That's a hundred percent. Of course, like no one ever does that. Yeah, no one no one no one ever reaches their potential, right? Yeah. Right. But you would want to kind of be like, well, like is 80% good enough? Is, mm-hmm. you know, is 85% good enough? Can I achieve that every time? Yeah. Because of course, to someone who's not you, they don't really know what your, your threshold is. Yeah. I mean, and so I feel like if you can, basically, if you can at least get to a place where I'm working on a song, I'm practicing mm-hmm. at home. And once I practice it, like objectively, every time I play, I can reach that threshold then you're like well i must be good to go because i'm prepared yeah and then hey you know if i'm really that prepared once i play with other musicians there's the potential that like well even if it all goes horribly wrong Mm. at least i won't go below 80 percent or 72 percent and hey you know the stars might align it might be like a really good night i got a really good night's sleep i had a good dinner and the other guys are playing their butts off yeah maybe i'll get to 92 percent 100 maybe i'll even get to 105 percent yeah, right. That happens, you know, but I think it only happens like if you prepare by practicing right. tunes and like really um, self-critique mm. pretty frequent, pretty frequently. But yeah. of course, like, you know, the process of transcription, you got to transcribe so you know, like what a good solo sounds like, what sure. it feels like technically, you know? Yeah. I mean, if you don't do that, there's really no barometer um, 
of excellence. Yeah. And so I feel like, especially like for the newbies, that's why transcription is so powerful because like, you know, it's one thing, of course, it's so valuable to go to a jazz performance and you hear some guys who are just like killing it and mm-hmm. everything they play is amazing, but your mind is kind of like so blown by, man, what just happened? Sure. You know, that you can't really take anything away, but like learning, you know, 12 measures of Charlie Parker, 12 yeah. measures of Hank Mobley, 12 measures of Grant Green, just like these quote unquote, alleged, allegedly, yeah, allegedly basic level guys, allegedly b- building block level guys. If yeah, you learn right. 12 measures of those guys, you're like, wow, that's a, that's a good standard. Yeah. That's like what those guys did. That's still the level. You know what I mean? Like that, at least that's a baseline level. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like yeah. allegedly Hank Mobley is simple, which is not, you know, allegedly yeah, right. Grant Green is simple, like which is not. Yeah. Allegedly Count no. Basie's piano playing no, is simple, which is not, you know, allegedly all of these guys. Yeah, right. Allegedly 12, 12 measures of that is simple. It's not. Yeah, right. So, and those, and that we're talking like ancient history, man, you know? Yeah. So it's like, if you can take 12, 24, 32 measures and like really play it, really own it, then you kind of know like, well, that's the standard. Like I yeah. should be able to do something that's in that ballpark <laughs> with 12 measures, sure. 24 measures of my solo. So right. forget the whole, forget like your ego of like, how did the whole night go? Right. Or how did the whole performance of the song go? It's like, that's really hard to control. Yeah. But yeah. like, can you start by controlling in my practice room? Can I take a good solo that's 12 measures long? Mm. Or four measures or two measures. Does that yeah. make sense? Yeah, yeah. Oh, for sure. And, and I so think, I think I think if you okay. I think if you like kind of approach it in that way, you're kind of like you're like looking for little victories, you know. Yeah. Um, and it's really helpful because the ups and downs of like playing gigs, it's huge. Mm. Um, but there's so many factors that that go into that, you know. Yeah. And it's kind of like I mean, the most important factor for any gig is your preparation level, right? Yeah, right. But there's some gigs you can't prepare for. <laughs> yeah, right, right. There's some situations you can't prepare for. I mean, jam sessions are a good example of that. Sure. Yeah. You go on stage and, you know, um, you don't know the song. You do know the song, but the band's mm-hmm. horrible. You do know the song, but the band is like so much better than you that you're intimidated. Right. You do know the song, but it's a different key. You don't know the song. I mean, those are, those are good like life lessons. Yeah. But on the other hand, like, I don't think they're really reflective of ever like how, like what you should really aspire for. You right. know what I mean? Like, yeah. I mean, there are people who are so experienced and they're such good players and their, their repertoire is so huge. They're like, yeah, they could sound good at a jam session on any song, but yeah. you have to be so experienced, you know? Yeah. Um, that's not really the same. So like there's people who could probably, who like in one objective standard like they would not sound so good at a jam session sure. but if they're really prepared they could do their own gig and it would sound pretty damn good you know yeah. right um but as i said like the jam session that is kind of in the jazz tradition i mean it's kind of designed to teach you like well you don't know this song yeah you you do need to be able to whatever do a song in a different key or just like figure it out how to fake your way through it and not sound horrible i mean that yeah that's valuable, but those aren't really like music lessons that I would necessarily like apply to like, how do I want to sound in my imaginary version of myself? You yeah. know, they're, they're just more like good life lessons. Yeah. I like that you said uh, things about uh, both life lessons and uh, little victories along the way, um, mm-hmm. because, and this is a good segue into uh, one of the other things I wanted to ask you about, which was, um, I have, and, and like you had said about not liking your own self, like listening back and then all these other people who we think never had a bad solo, but what do they think about their own playing? Uh, the most recent record that I put out was uh, last July. And I'm, and it's, it's this weird thing where you spend so much time with something and you, you, you get all the mixes and the master exactly how you want it. And you think, yes, finally, I'm able to release this into the world. I'm confident about it, this new record. And then for me at least, and I should work on this, but slowly over a course of about six months, eight months, I slowly get less confident in that album. And it gets to the point where I'm like, based on maybe my own perception of of personal growth and musical growth, I'm like, well, now I 
don't like that because I can hear all the imperfections that maybe I've worked on or I've shed mm -hmm. in the meantime. Um, and it's caused me to want to like go forward and just make another record so I can keep documenting those right. you know, little victories or those checkpoints along the way. Um, but also I find that, you know, when I make records, it's not the first one was kind of this way, but the second one and the third one and this next one, which is four of them to make one mega work is uh, profoundly personal and follows a narrative that sometimes is obvious to the listener and sometimes is more just therapeutic for me. And one of the things that I really love about you and your playing is that both on your bio, you said uh, it says like based out of Austin, Jacob Wise is a jazz guitarist with an open mind. And I think everybody can sense that, um, that you are very like open-minded and it feels like you have like a very visceral personal connection with the music that you're playing. Um, and uh, not only that, it just feels like you're very resolved in the way that you're playing, which I know is like, yeah, everybody has their insecurities, but from, you know, from me looking at, at you, I remember the first time that we played together, uh, and I guess the only time was a jam session. Just mm -hmm. one night, uh, Mike put me and you on stage together, and mm -hmm. I was, I had known your name, I had seen you play before. I don't think I had ever come up to you specifically and talked to you because I was intimidated because you just sound incredible. And so I was like, oh shit, you know, I really got to have my stuff together whenever I step on stage. But it was very evident that even in that setting which jams can be kind of a, you know, I don't want to call it a free for all, but sometimes it, there's just a lot of unknown factors, right? So you really mm -hmm. have to be on your toes. It still felt like you were just very resolved. And it's like, nope, this is, this is my lane. I'm going to stay in it, but I'm also going to be mindful of everybody around me. So I guess from a jumping back to the album kind of analogy, um, how do you find that you follow maybe a narrative and we can talk about Paseo, um, a narrative or how do you feel resolved in making those records and what, what kind of draws you to uh, curate like a certain kind of set list for an album that will maybe be personally therapeutic to, right. for you? Or is it just oh, an yeah, amalgamation yeah, yeah, yeah. of tunes? No, that's a great, that's a great question. Like, and I mean, like, thanks, man. That's a really, I mean, like, nice compliment. I mean, if I was to go back to like jam sessions, like, you know, it is a free for all. You should expect it to be a free for all. You should expect it to be disorganized. I mean, for me, it's like, if I'm able to, like appear seem to be confident in that situation. It's just because like, well, I mean, I played at that jam session so many times that sure. it sort of feels natural to me. Um, yeah. And of course, you know, that's not the only jam session I've played at. I mean, there's many others, but you just kind of sure. learn like, well, here's what I know how to do at a jam session and just, but also like, you know, I mean, before we get into the, the um, album thing, it's like, yeah. you know, just like being a professional musician on like a freaking cruise ship for four yeah. years and playing with like every kind of like weird band, weird <laughs> guest entertainer, weird dog yeah. and pony, like magic show. Sure. You just kind of get comfortable with like, Oh wow. And now this is going to happen. Okay. Yeah. Like let's just keep going and like, try, try to, try to be, <laughs> try to be right. cool about it. You know? Yeah. Um, so that, that definitely helped because like, of course, like the first, you know, the first couple of years that I went to jam sessions, I was totally a newbie, probably not really qualified to be there. And I was just like, Whoa deer in the headlights yeah the whole time so i mean it's just kind of like if, if i'm able to appear that i'm comfortable doing that it's just because i've been i've been doing a little longer yeah and that's in some ways is is a little more of a comfort zone for me sure but anyway like back to the album thing i mean you know as you said like jet albums but especially jazz albums they're more like a snapshot of time it's really easy to overthink it and we're like you know, in the 21st century, we're in a very weird time for jazz because like, I mean, let's think about, okay, like in the history of jazz, I guess we would acknowledge there are certain landmark albums, right? Yeah, right. Okay, like, well, you know, Giant Steps was a landmark album. Speak No Evil is a landmark album. Clifford Brown and Max Roach is a landmark album. I, I don't know, you know, yeah. Miles, Miles, sure. ESP, you know, Someday My Prince Will Come, you know, these whatever. Yeah. Witten Marsalis, Black Codes from the Underground. Yeah. And the list goes on. These are what we consider like landmark yeah. albums. Okay. Right. So there's these landmark albums that are like these Holy Grail type albums that are like, oh man, we aspire to that. You know, every composition is amazing. Every solo is amazing. Maybe even like the production, the track sequencing, the album art is amazing. 
Okay, those are great albums. Yeah. And then there's the million other albums, right? Which were just yeah, like right. products in a pipe. <laughs> especially vocal yeah. albums. Not that I'm an expert, but I'm just kind of like, okay, well, like how many, and these are probably all quality albums. How many Ella Fitzgerald sure. albums were there? I mean, hundreds, right? How many yeah, like right. Sarah Vaughn albums, Anita O'Day albums? How many, like, let's talk about the allegedly, not really, lesser singers. Like how many, like Chris Connor albums, you know, people mm -hmm. like that. It's like, I, I don't know, man, but there were like a lot. And that yeah. concept of recording albums was just like, you know, the artists, they weren't self-produced. The artist was signed to a yeah. record label. They had a manager. They had a producer. They had an A&R person. It's like Ella Fitzgerald, on August 1st, you are going in the studio. Yeah. And you're right. going to record 12 songs. And I have decided on your behalf that these will be Rogers and Hart songs. Right. Yeah. So, I mean, like, how much of Ella Fitzgerald's, like, ego and her personal story was really in that in that, I don't know. I think she just wanted like, I got to sing these songs the best I can. Yeah. I want it to be rehearsed. I want the arrangements to be good. I mean, um, I'm not that I'm an expert on vocal jazz. I'm not, but like those weren't no, concept no, albums, yeah. right? Yeah. That was just like, we're going to yeah. make a good album and hopefully it'll sell. Of course, like in that time frame in the fifties, like, well, Frank's not a superstar. He can right. get a little more concept album with it. He's like, I want to do only the lonely. I want to do, you know, yeah. all of these heartbreak songs. I want these songs i want mm. these arrangements arranged by this guy nelson yeah. riddle or whatever so he's kind of getting into yeah. concept album territory and you know he can have a spiel about like well you know this album man it was about whatever i mean i don't know if he spieled on about the story of this album like ava gardner we, she broke my heart and we got back together sure yada 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 but i mean the point i'm trying to get to is that like i mean basically if you look at all these like landmark albums i mean Miles Davis, John Coltrane, they just had a lot of albums and they, they kind of cranked them out. I don't think they spent as much time on their landmark albums as I did, or maybe you did, like doing like one little self-produced album. Yeah. So the, so the tendency to overthink it is so much more, you know? Mm, right. Um, and that's just kind of the, I don't, I don't want to call it a drawback. It's just the sure. age we live in, you know? It's kind of like, if I want to do an album, like i have to produce it myself right right no one no one is asking me to do an album yeah much less no one is fronting the money for yeah. me to do an album <laughs> so i mean and i i don't you know use this term light, lightly that just makes all of our albums technically mm. vanity projects mm. but that's okay i mean like you know it's like if you do a painting at home that's a vanity project too yeah <laughs> Right. If you can sell it, you can sell it. So like what, what, you know, you have to think more like, well, what is even the point of doing an album these yeah. days? I don't know. I mean, there's people yeah. who know the answer to that question better than me. I just kind of know that like, as a musician, if you're like, I'm a musician who has a, I'm a performing artist, mm -hmm. you must have an album. Yeah. Right. And right. like in my, in my imagination, it's like, well, if I'm going to do an album for me, I don't really think that's appropriate for me. Mm -hmm. an album of all jazz standards like yeah. why like well different reasons like i mean there's no real glory in doing those songs unless you can do them very very well right. as well or better than previous recordings and it has to be very very personal playing style and arrangement of those like can i do yeah. that like I, I don't know yeah and then basically you think like all the, the people that like i admired it's like, well, they did all make their own albums and they, they threw a lot of composition, their own compositions on there. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of like, not that I would consider myself to be a, a, good, a great or even good composer or like, do I know, have I studied composition? <laughs> Except for that one semester <laughs> it's like, hey, with that weird guy. Um, like, would I consider myself to be expert in that? No, but like, I'm going to try. Right. I mean, which is like, I don't really know what that attitude is other than like, I'm just going to fucking do it, you know? Yeah. Right. And, and so that's the thing. It's like, you know, people who are like really media savvy, they're like, well, you know, I wanted to record this album. It was based on this thing I was going through, man, this experience, this breakup. I found Jesus. I traveled the world. I went to South Asia. You know, I went to Rwanda. I helped the children, man. You know, yeah, sure. it's like, I mean, not, I'm exaggerating. Sounds like we're talking about you too now, you know, but. <laughs> or something. I don't know. But anyway, I mean, for me, it's just kind of like, well, I wanted to do an album and. 
these were the songs I had and I wanted to write a couple extra ones. Yeah. And of course, you know, if you're going to record 10 songs, I guess it'd be preferable to write 15 yeah. and cut the five crappy ones. Yeah, sure, sure, sure. That, that, that album, Paseo, which I'm proud of, by the mm -hmm. way, you know, I think it would came out well, you know, yeah. but like, that's basically like the 10 songs that I wrote in whatever, you know, the previous five or six years that I thought were good. Yeah. But I mean, you know, the concept of that album was like, okay, I did this album when I was in grad school and it was like really thrillingly titled Jacob Wise Creole. But, you know, that album, like, I'm proud of that too. It was all original compositions and it was a trio format. And now in hindsight, I realized like, dude, that was, you bit off more than you could chew. Mm. That was like a, a ballsy, a ballsy, bold move because like, a, it's hard to play all in trio format. You know what I mean? Yeah, 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 yeah. It's hard to do that. Like, I, you know, but I was like, I just didn't know. And I just didn't really, at the time, I was like, well, this is the album that I have the wherewithal to do. Yeah. Um, I, I was in grad school in Denton. I was playing with guys in Austin, a great bass player, Aaron Allen, great drummer, Andy Bodeman. I was like, I have this rapport with these guys. I would come back and play with them. Let's do an album. Yeah. It was cool. It was fine. But then, you know, some years go by. I'm like, okay, I want to do another album. I definitely don't want to do another trio album. That, that was too mm -hmm. hard, too yeah. stressful. Sure. So, but I like playing with this bass player and drummer. I like Damien Garcia. He's a fantastic piano player. Let's get him on it. Yeah. And then basically like, I'm going to choose the best songs. Um, but there's really like, I mean, honestly, like no theme behind it. I mean, like these are eight or nine songs that I think are good. I yeah. think they could go together well on an album with good track sequencing. Yeah. But I mean, at the end of the day, it's like in my perfect world, it's like someone's paying you to do albums and they're like, man, we need more product for the pipeline. Yeah. It's like, well, we want a new Jacob Wise album every two years or every 18 yeah. months. Well, it's like, then you actually have a reason to sit down and write tunes. Yeah. Like, which I, which I didn't and I don't, yeah. you know what I mean? Um, and so that's kind of like, that just highlights the difference between, from, from me, from my perspective, between like 2021 and back in the day. So yeah. back in the day, like a guitar player who I think is great, Grant Green, he was on Blue Note Records. He put out a lot of records. And of course he was yeah. a sideman on a lot of records. But if you just look at him as a leader, there's a lot of Grant Green records floating around. But I mean, that guy didn't really write a, write a lot of songs. Sure. Yeah. He's considered one of the most legendary players of all times. Yeah. I mean, this is basically like standard after standard after standard after like blues song. But I mean, he cranked out probably dozens of albums. Yeah. Not, not that they're all in that equally high caliber, but the expectation, it's like really different, right? It's like, yeah. it's kind of like, man, nowadays, like if you want to put out a good record, you can't just, you know, put out a standard record because that's lazy. You know, yeah. like the expectation is that you got to be a great composer. And a great arranger, like basically, you know, you right. gotta be Pat Metheny, man, or like yeah. you gotta be Steely Dan, Chick Corea mm. type mentality, just to do like yeah. your little self-produced record. Maybe no one's ever gonna hear. Yeah, I mean, sure. That's that's from my perspective. That's kind of the thought that goes through my head. But it's like, well, if that's what it is, let's do it. You know? Yeah. Right. Um. So, uh, we did it, right? Um and but at the end of the day it's just a snapshot because yeah. i mean i think it's kind of like hey songs are songs the performances are, are the performances the production mm -hmm. is the production i mean in a in a crazy world which like i would never do this sure but it's kind of like hey let's record let's re-record the whole album this year <laughs> oh, okay yeah yeah to see yeah we record yeah. the whole album but it's like this time i've won i've won the lottery i'm a multi-millionaire instead of taking two days to do it we could take a week yeah and i could do it however i want i could just record the songs over and over again till i get a live take that i like yeah come on dude you're not living in the real world yeah or like i can i can record all the basic tracks and everybody home and re-record all my solos which is how allegedly pat Metheny does it and his albums yeah. are perfect you know yeah but it's like yeah i don't live i don't live in that world you know but i'm saying like th these are my these are my thoughts. Like these yeah. are my second guessing thoughts. But at, at the end of the day, it's kind of like, yeah, that doesn't really matter, man. Like, I mean, I did it. 
Like, was it good enough? I don't know. It's like, what do you guys think? I mean, yeah. in my opinion about my own album doesn't matter after it's done. Sure. Because I'm not trying to sell it to myself. Yeah, know? right. <laughs> I'm, trying, yeah. I'm trying to sell it to like the outside world. Yeah. Now, of course, selling it has less than nothing to do with the product. Yeah. You see what I mean? Yeah. No, absolutely. I mean, the, product could be, the product could be shit. The product could be great. But selling it, that's a completely different world. You know? Yeah. And like, right. hey, I wish I was more attentive. I wish I had been more attentive to all that. Mm -hmm. But I mean, that's a full-time job. I mean, it's like, you right. know, do I want to put all my time into marketing it? Do I want to pay somebody to do right. it? I don't think so. Right. I mean, as you know, Christian, it's like we're living like in a very weird time in the music business. Yeah. Um, and, you know, as we know, yeah, the jazz and classical section of the market is 2%. Yeah. Officially, it's 2%. Yeah. So you're kind of like, well, what do you, what do, you do with that information? I'm not sure. I mean, like, I'm still trying to figure, I'm trying to figure all that out. But yeah. for me, like, as you said, I mean, not to, not to deflect or like belittle like your initial question. It's like, no, hey, no, no. Like, like, what is the narrative of this album? It's like, dude, I just tried to make like the coolest album I could make with yeah. the coolest songs I had with the coolest guys I knew at the coolest studio I could afford yeah. in the time I had. Yeah. And you're like, I did it. And then it's kind of like, okay, well now, now what? I mean, I got to yeah. try to vlog it somehow, you know, right. Somebody for please sure. help me to do that, you know? <laughs> yeah, for sure. Well, I think it like, and I think that's a totally fine. Again, like these are all just, you know, varying different perspectives of like making things. And I'm not saying that I am not on, on the same wavelength as that, because I think that a lot of the things that you said resonate very strongly with me. One of them very specifically being, I remember in 2019 being at Birdland and staying after to talk to somebody who I was seeing and for the sake of just an anonymity, I won't say who it was, but I remember them saying to me or uh, saying to the person in front of me, uh, they were like, Oh yeah. Like uh, you, you did this. I can't give too much weight. You did this one record and it's stuff that's not the normal jazz type repertoire. And the person who I saw said, yeah, and I did that because the, the Great American Songbook and standards are played out. There's not really too much more we can do with it unless we like go way off the wall and really kind of deconstruct it and make it something different. And the person said, I want to, that's why I did X record because I wanted to do more of this. And the only reason why I'm not saying this person's name is just because I don't know if that's something that they want on the <laughs> record anywhere if it was just an after show interaction. But to that point, I think that is why I'm so drawn uh, to people like Kurt Elling because of the fact that like, he's not, it was my biggest frustration when I was 18 and tried to listen to him for the first time and turned it off. Cause I was like, I can't get into this because I couldn't recognize like any of like the melodies exactly how they were. And I was like, why doesn't he just, and then I would go to like people like Chet Baker or like Frank Sinatra. And then now, and, and nothing against Chet Baker, but like the, the Sinatra thing is like really not in my view, like at all. And it's more about these people who are really starting to branch out and, and be creative with reinterpretations of standards or like lesser known standards or just pre-existing jazz tunes. And then also originals, but then even more so than that, uh, um, or like, I guess maybe not more so, but somewhere in between standards and originals is adding original content to things that were not the original inception of the project, a very convoluted way to say vocalese, right? Because I feel like vocalese is a way of, of adding and maybe a new narrative to something that was pre-existing and breathing a little bit more new life into it for better or worse. I mean, I know there's a lot the vocalese can be kind of controversial to talk about because more often than not, you get a lot of bad vocalies, but then you have somebody like Kurt Elling who comes along, who, in my opinion, you know, puts stuff to, you know, Wayne Shorter's solo on Go, you know, and it's like ridiculous, like on the new record he put out with Danilo Perez. So it's that kind of stuff that just, I think they're it, it, making albums and the concept or the the inspiration behind it or the uh, whatever, whatever you're thinking does run a gamut. But I think I... I am closer to where you're thinking. I do like to have narrative and something that maybe means something personal to me. So that way I can have a very clear vision of the arrangement that I want to write. But at the same time, I don't want to do something that just feels like it's, you know. Right. Well, I mean, Christian, if I, if I might say, it's like, I mean, it's like, it's worth like really like having a conversation about in the year 2021, does the word album really mean jazz, right? Sure, like, sure. Do we need albums? I mean, albums 
albums didn't exist, right? Yeah. The albums didn't exist in the 50s. We had them in the 50s. We, we sold billions of albums in the 60s, 70s, sure. 80s, 90s. And then with the internet, albums became worthless and it's all about streaming. So like, yeah. I mean, it's valid and I'm not, I'm not a music industry expert, but it's like, is it, yeah. it's valid as like, what is, is the concept of an album, like a curated set mm. of music that's, you know, 50 to 70 minutes, you know, with possibly uh, a through, a through line. Yeah. Is that really even a relevant concept in today's music? And it's like, I don't know. Like, I think it, mm. it could be, I mean, I've always enjoyed this concept of, an album as a unified um, body of work. Yeah. Is that relevant to how people consume music? Like sure. maybe, maybe not. I mean, in, in, in the day, like was the concept of an album, was that really relevant to the way that most of what we consider to be legendary instrumentalists conceived of their music? Sure. Like, I mean, Charlie Parker, well, there was Charlie Parker with strings. That mm -hmm. was an album concept. Yeah. Everything else was just Charlie Parker playing songs yeah. very well with different sure. bands and shorter or longer takes of those songs, right? Sure, sure, sure. And the albums were just compilations. Of course, he, so he wasn't really considered an album artist. Got it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. And so we've kind of gotten, we've gotten used to thinking of albums as like, it's something that is natural to music and recorded music because there are, of course, like landmark jazz albums that are, have a unified uh they seem cohesive sure but the, what i'm the point i'm trying to make is those albums are pretty rare yeah right right those albums are pretty rare and i mean and they're usually usually what what holds them together in my view is the composition like mm. if you buy like a pat metheny album all songs mm. by pat metheny and lyle Mix, right yeah and of course that's pretty specific to them it's like you buy a John Coltrane album, if it's one of the good ones, you're like, well, all songs by John Coltrane. Yeah. All songs right. by Wayne Shorter. Yeah. Et cetera. I mean, like I said, the it's a it's a huge universe, but to me, that's that's cool. But that yeah. that I mean, that whole concept of jazz albums, to me, is kind of from my point of view, it speaks yeah. more towards composition. Sure. You know? But I mean, like obviously in this day and age, like you can record any eight tracks, yeah. put it on Bandcamp and call it an album. Yeah. Right. Like, and, there, and there's a lot of amateur people who do that. It's like, well, sure. this is just the amateur, you know, granddad, Dixieland jazz band. Sure. And you're going to put it, call it an album and put it up there. Like, I don't have a problem with that. Yeah. You know, but it's just kind of like, like, what is an album for? I mean, yeah. remember, the only reasons albums ever existed were to make money for the record company. Sure. They weren't really there. Hey, John Coltrane, we want to give you a platform for artistic self-expression. Sure, sure. You know, it's just like John Coltrane had a contract where he's like, I record what I want to record. Yeah. Because if he had a contract with some crappy record label and they're like, John Coltrane, my favorite things was good. So we're, you're contractually obliged to do an album of John Coltrane plays The Sound of Music. Right. And then you're, then you're going to get like John Coltrane Edelweiss and all this bullshit. Yeah. <laughs> and, and John Coltrane was very aware of that. He was like, I sure. definitely don't want to be that guy. So I'm sure whatever his contract with Impulse Records, it was kind of like, I got final cut. Yeah. Right. Kind of thing. But Impulse Records, like, hey, we're still going to make money off of this guy. Yeah. You know, but I mean, let me put it this way Impulse Records wasn't making Herb Alpert type bucks off of John Coltrane. Sure. Yeah. 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 They weren't making Sergio Mendez in Brazil 66 bucks off of John Coltrane. Yeah. You know, and so that's, that's kind of like, I think people can kind of get like a little bit of a myopic view of the business. So mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, as I said, the album, it's my vanity project. There's no expectation that it would make a lot of money, but wouldn't that be nice? Yeah. Like, right. How, how the hell, how the hell does that even work? But back in the day, the only reason albums existed was to make money for the record company and a lot more money for the record company than the artist. Than the artist. Yeah. It was never, it was never a fair exchange. Yeah. So as I said, like, I don't really pretend to have it figured out. I'm just kind of more like, well, I did, a, I did an album that I'm proud of. Like, I yeah. wish more people would listen to it. Um, I wish I knew how to get it out there. But that's, that is a game that is totally separate from music. I mean, kind of, I mean, if you're not that you asked me this question, but like, I'll just, sure. I'll just tell you, it's like, well, you're like, so when are you going to do like another album? It's like, mm. well, I don't know. First, like when I write eight more songs, yeah, right. <laughs> like I haven't done, I don't yeah. really see any 
motivation to like compose music if there's not a project to do it for. Yeah. And I mean, I mean, like to me, it would have to be like, well, I have some regular gigs where I have a band and I want to bring in some new stuff for them to play. Right. So without even that minor motivation, there's really no reason to like write new stuff because like I don't consider myself a composer first and foremost. Sure. You know? Sure. And then it's kind of like, okay, well, once that happens, you know, once the Rona blows over and you have like some imaginary regular hip and cool gig in Austin, uh, yeah. didn't have that before the Rona, right? Then, <laughs> right, then like, then I'll write some songs and we'll, we'll, we'll get, we'll get a vibe, man. We'll get some yeah, cool new yeah. stuff. We'll be into our vibe. Then I'll record an album. It's like, wait, then I need $5,000 or whatever. Yeah. Right. 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 So then I'm going to take my $5,000 and I'm going to lavish it. I'm going to lavish my $5,000 on the studio, the engineer, uh-huh. the mastering guy, the other musicians, of course, because you got to pay them to do your record. Right. I'm going to lavish that five thousand and the album art person. I'm going to lavish that $5,000 on him. And now I've got my album It's on Spotify. And maybe even have some hard copies. Yeah. So what's my ROI on that 5,000 copies? Like, That's I don't know, man. Like yeah. I need to, I need to figure it out. Like, I mean, how, I mean, Hey man, I would just like to get, I'm not thinking, let me spend $5,000 and make $10,000. Yeah. I'm thinking like, Hey, if I could spend $5,000 and make $2,000 and only lose $3,000, that'd be great. Yeah. Now that's, that might be like too much realness. You know what yeah. I mean? Yeah. And maybe, maybe that makes me sound like I'm defeatist or like I'm unsuccessful, but like, I mean, I don't know, like if we had a closed door meeting of like everybody in town who recorded an album and expenses versus revenues, yeah. what would that look like? Yeah. I'm just saying, but that's jazz. Yeah. I think you can, you could, you could, you could make money recording music in different genres, yeah. but you gotta know how to market it. Yeah. Don't, don't talk to me about that. I'm not a marketing professional. Yeah, sure. You know what I mean, I mean, this is, and this is, this is the stuff they don't teach you at school, by oh, the yeah. way. Yeah. Right. I did say they, they did offer a good, a good music business class in North Texas. And I took it. It was like kind of a beta, beta version of the class, you know, beta okay. testing. But it was good. I mean, the instructor is a great trumpet player named uh, Jason Levi. Um, he, you know, he was in the one o'clock band. He went on to have like a good career in Vegas. And he had mm-hmm. some kind of side hustles, like some, some, some trumpet books. And he, he was into it, man. He was like, you know, you got to have a business plan. You got to have an accountant. You know, he's like, you, everybody should, should set up an LLC or a DBA. Yeah, like getting right. getting pretty getting pretty intense. It's like I don't know about that, man. Yeah, you know? right. <laughs> but I mean, you know, it's like all that stuff is important to think about. But like, I'm not really in in a position where I can afford to make that um, my focus. So it's more like yeah. I, I did this album. It's cool. I hope you like it. It's out there for free on the evil thing called Spotify. But yeah, right. If you want to play the game, that's what it is. Yeah, and in, in the 21st century, in my in my opinion. Sure. Well, uh, it's it's on the evil thing of Spotify for free. Uh, but Jacob Wise, where you can buy it on, you can buy it on yeah. but you can buy it on Bandcamp. That that's what I was gonna I was gonna try to do a natural plug. So it's on Bandcamp. Everybody can go and yeah, buy and, it there. and guess yeah. what? Like I have I have several hundred physical CDs sitting in my closet. Guess what? They make great stocking stuffers. They make great coasters. If you right. want to like put a twenty dollar bill in an envelope and mail it to me, wow, how crazy! Mm-hmm. Yeah, like. I would say I would mail them back to you, you know? Yeah, sure. But anyway, I don't know. I mean, I don't really have too much else to say about the album than like, sure. hey, like I wrote nine, whatever songs I think are cool. I would love to play them again, but yeah. I'd have to have gigs in order to play the songs. Sure. Because it's like, you know, you write the songs, you write the arrangements, you practice the songs, you go in the studio and then like, I don't play those songs again. Ever. Right. Yeah. But like, I would like to. That's why yeah. the, the gig uh, the other night was so cool. The Monk's gig i played with the trio yeah. but i was like okay i want to play some of my original tunes and it's tunes that i don't play that often but like i'm gonna play them i'm gonna practice them and it felt good to do that i was like wow there is some these are nice songs i like playing them there's some validity in them and so that kind of yeah. gave me a little most motivation in the future hey if there's more gigs i'm gonna bring out more of these original songs i mean to me right from one manner of speaking there's not a real strong motivation to write and record more songs until i've worn out these songs sure because i got songs i never really played on gigs and they're cool songs you know yeah so i mean as far as like having a repertoire of stuff that's fresh mm. i have it it's sitting there on the record i just haven't had the opportunity to share it with the wider world right 
Yeah. The thing that we always close with is uh, that we all have like gigs from hell and we've kind of touched on a little bit of that, but uh, do you have like a standout story that's like, yeah, there's like, there's, just like, there's like too many. There's too many. Sure. Can you think of one? Uh, I'll tell you two. Okay. And they were both uh, cruise ship related, of okay. course. Great. <laughs> um, yeah. So we were doing the South American cruise and it was really exciting. This was in 2013. Mm-hmm. And we were going to go to Brazil. And this was a big deal because I had tried to get a Brazilian like visa. And for whatever reason, I couldn't get one. So I was bummed. I was thinking I can't go to Brazil. Yeah. And we get, we get there, we dock in Rio and they're like, well, everybody gets to go to Rio except for the Americans. You guys are stuck on this ship. Oh man. I'm like, this blows. So yeah. Um, stuck on the ship, watching everybody have a great time in Rio. Then the next port of call was a town called, actually, I might be getting this out of order. Anyway, all I know is I was bummed because I couldn't go to Rio, but there's a town called Recife or Recife. And I was like, they're like, oh, but you can go ashore in this one, just not in Rio. I was like, wait, that's really inconsistent, but like, I'm going to take advantage of this. Sure. I'm going to, I'm going to go out. Well, I wasn't feeling so great that morning. I thought I might be coming down with something. You know, it's like February in, in Recife. It's like right around the equator. It's like fucking hot. Yeah. And I'm walking around. I'm like, this city is amazing, man. It's like colonial grandeur, but it's decaying. And like, there's so much food on the street. All the carnival decorations are up. And like, what? This guy is selling hundreds of goldfish and baggies. And I'm like, I'm loving it. I'm feeling like sicker and sicker and sicker and sicker. Oh, no. The whole time. I just feel like so crap. And I'm like, I don't feel well. But I get back to the gig, I get back to the ship, and I'm like, well, what's tonight's show? Or oh, we're backing up some guest entertainer. Well, basically, um, I mean, the next day I learned I had the flu, like, really bad, right? Oh, no. But, like, I couldn't, I, I, had, to, I had to go out and, like, bake in the heat for four hours. Then I had to come on stage. And it's like, I, I got to be the tough guy. I got to play this gig. And, like, literally, you know, you're wearing a suit. Mm. I'm wearing, you know an undershirt, a white shirt, a collared shirt, a, a black dress suit. And I'm like, I feel so bad. I'm like, you know, hot and cold chills. First I'm freezing, got to put on another layer Then I'm yeah. sweating through the whole thing. And I was like, you know, it's like this whole like night of whatever shit show we're playing. It's like, am yeah. I hallucinating? What's going on here? I felt no, horrible. No, no, and then no. of course, like the next morning I went to the clinic and they, you know, up your nose, like you got the flu, man. You got a quarantine. Mm. You shouldn't, you shouldn't have been off the ship. You shouldn't have been, even been playing the show last night. Mm. Oh, I'm sorry. You know, and so then they quarantine you in a tiny cabin for like two days. You can't talk to anybody. They bring you room service. Of course, I was fine. Mm -hmm. I was just like, oh, my God, like I (laughs) I'm trapped. I'm trapped on the hell ship. So that was one. And then there was another one. And I can't remember because I did eight contracts. That's eight contracts times four months. But I'm I can't remember which ship this was. So I can't tell you specifically where in the world we were. Yeah. Um. But let's just go with, because there was a really huge tropical, it wasn't a tropical storm. It was a, it was just a storm. Sure. Because it's, it's in the North Sea. It couldn't have been tropical. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> There's no way it could have been tropical. But it was a storm in the North Sea that was just like epic and like, you know, terrifying. But so let's just say that it was during this one and not the other 10 storms we were in around mm-hmm. the world. But at some point, it's a huge theater. It's got a really deep stage and um, there's all kinds of props for different shows um, that are stored backstage that are not really backstage. They're just like in the back of the, of the proscenium area or whatever you call it. Right. Um, And so for some reason there was some show, I don't remember what it was, but they had these giant Roman um, columns. Right. And they're like, you know, 15, 20 feet tall. They're made out of styrofoam. Um, they, but they're white and they're they're very yeah. heavy, but they're not as heavy as real stone, obviously. And they're kind of like lashed in there, you know, somehow with bungee cords to keep them mm. safe. So all I remember is like we're rehearsing in the afternoon, some show, a production show with singers and dancers. And the ship is like really moving. Yeah. You know, like I don't know how the dancers were able to stay standing up. I'm sitting on like a rock and sock drum throw and it's like literally like, whoa, mm. here we go. Like this is yeah. this is fucked up. This is not good. This is not really safe, especially for the dancers. Yeah. And like at some point, like, I mean, the ship just turned and like one of the, one of these like Roman styrofoam columns fell down and the next one fell down 
and now like they're rolling around the stage oh my god ship is, and like you know the stage hands are like going nuts yeah they're like running around like army ants like trying to corral these things um yeah it's just like it's kind of like it was humorous like kind of terrifying because like yeah. hey what if that had been heavy yeah right made out of metal like what's happening to all the plates in the galley right now what's happening to my stuff yeah i mean like pretty freaky Jeez. um but of course like they, they fixed it and then like you know we we're in some kind of storm the the ship's motion is not going to go away for a few hours until yeah, right. we get out of wherever we are right <laughs> but you know it's one of those things where like the the show there it was it was moving it wasn't great it was okay ish but like the rehearsal was just like oh my god yeah like, but you know they don't cancel it yeah right they don't cancel it you know they're just like you're just, you're just gonna play you know yeah. um but i mean there's there's many i'll give you one more this one okay so this one we're um we're in australia we're on the sun sun princess the smallest okay. rustiest leakiest <laughs> ship in the fleet <laughs> um and the stinkiest because it was always leaking water all the hallway carpets sure. would get wet and they'd have to rip them out Anyway, it's an antique. So for this show, we had a show called Piano Man, and it's a pretty good show. So the stage setup for this one is they put a white uh, grand piano, and I think it was a real grand piano, on a on a small riser at the front of the stage. And the house band pianist, he or she, plays the entire show on stage on this white piano because it's the Piano Man show, right? Yeah, so right. We're doing Piano Man, of course. Manilow can't smile without you. Yeah. Mandy, some good Neil Sedaka, Laughter in the Rain, and some all these like piano songs. Sure. So she's on, she was a great plan, but she's on stage. Where Where is the band? Well, for whatever reason, the designers of the theater, in their infinite wisdom, had decided to make uh, an actual retractable band platform lift that okay. would, you would, before the show, all your gear, all the rhythm section and horn players, their gear is on this lift. That's like, you know, six by 12 feet and it's suspended to the roof of the theater by chains. What else? So before the set, you all jump on there, you set up, you sound check, and then they're like, okay, showtime's in five minutes. They crank up and you go, you know, eight or nine feet in the air. And so I don't even know if the audience could see us or not. I guess we could, because we could see them. Sure. But we're suspended up there on this like, you know, rickety stage lift from like 1995. <laughs> Right. Yeah. And I mean, you know, we did the show um, once a week or like once every 10 days, two performances. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, the inevitable happened. Right. So like after a certain point, it's like the second show, it's like, all right, all right, ladies and gentlemen, big round of applause. That was piano, man. Let's hear it for your lovely singers and dancers, the production singers. All right. You know, we're gonna have an intermission, yada, yada. Cool. They close the curtains. All right. Let us down guys. And they're like, Nothing happens. We're sitting there, like nothing's happening. Like, guys, what's up? Hey, I'm sorry, I'm pushing the button. And we're like, but we're up here and we have oh, half an hour before the next show and we haven't eaten dinner God. yet. So, you know, whatever happened, like we were, we were definitely stuck up there for a good 10, 15 minutes. And like, yeah. there's no way to jump down. That wouldn't yeah, be right. safe. And you know, everything is up there. The drums, the saxophone, it's like, what are we supposed to do here? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, I mean, it would have been yeah. better if we were stuck there in front of the audience yeah and they were trying to let us down oh there's so many i could i could go on i could go on and on you know oh, it's so funny I'll give you i'll give you one more yeah please so, same ship we're in the uh whatever they call it, the explorer's lounge this is the lounge in the back of the ship okay so one of the beautiful things about cruise ships is you get to play with instrumental violin soloists and it's a, it's a uk aussie thing so these are guys who they play the violin and they play stuff like um Harry Potter theme music with a band okay. or okay. gladiator theme music with a band. Got it. Well, the funniest thing was before the show started, the pre-show music, the sound guy had some music played through the house and through the stage monitors for whatever reason. And that music was Kenny G. So it's like the sweet sounds of Kenny G, the warming up the crowd. And then the violin guy is going to come and play theme from gladiator. Um, John, maybe it's John Williams. I don't know. Yeah. Anyway, so he does his intro and these guys all play with backing tracks. Okay. So, so it's kind of like, all right, you got your music. All right, welcome so-and-so, the fantastic violin player. So the guy comes out, the guy pushes play on the track. It's like one, two, three, four. Gladiator theme music starts playing. I don't know if it's in four or six or whatever. Mm -hmm. we're, we're playing along with that. 
And then like after like 20 seconds, it's like, hey, fuck, like, I think I can still hear Kenny G in the monitors. Oh, no. Right. <laughs> and so like the band is like, hey, yeah, he's got both tracks playing at the same time. You forgot to turn the Kenny G off. And then he's like, wait a minute. Because, you know, we, we're tacit at times, sure. right? We're tacit. So he's like, hold on. If Kenny G is coming through the monitors, then Kenny G is coming through the house also. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So this guy was trying to do, and then and then the, the violin player realized it. He's like, wait a minute, I'm, I'm getting confused. I'm here, I'm playing with my track and you guys, but Kenny G is playing. Yeah. And so like, I don't know, maybe we got through the song and I mean, somebody had to yell like, hey, turn off the- Turn it turn off, off the yeah. Show music. Yeah, it was great. Oh man, yeah, if I, I had a nickel. They, they, those guys aren't really trained sound guys all the time. Sure. They're guys who were promoted from like a stage tech. So they don't really always understand all the patching. Yeah. If I had a nickel for every time that I was playing a, uh, a, a steakhouse gig and some random server comes on and accidentally turns on the house music when we're in the middle of a tune, yeah, yeah, I would be able to quit playing. <laughs> no, I, thought, I thought it was. I thought it was pretty. I thought it was pretty hilarious. So yeah, yeah, there's. I mean, I'm sure there's. I'm sure there's more. There's a lot. There's a lot more. And that's for that's sure. one of the, the cool things about that gig is it gives you. Um, a lifetime of stories well hey yeah. man this has been a really cool conversation thanks for letting me run my mouth and just kind of course, talk man. about whatever i, re I really yeah. enjoyed having the opportunity yeah man jacob this was so much fun man can't wait to see you soon and again congratulations on the uh, monk show and then everybody go to jacobwise.bandcamp.com i i believe so yeah i'll drop the link i'll, I'll put yeah, it in can, there they can find it for sure yeah for sure all, all right. right man have a great afternoon good to thanks, see you Christian. you too yeah, bye bye thanks. bye
Thank you.